Okay. All right, we're live streaming. Wee wee, everybody. Hello. We're all ready. Okay. All right, we have Inkshin coming in. We've got more and more people coming in. Woo woo woo. Hello, hello. Hello, Inkshin. Okay, we're gonna start right now. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to Online with the Pros. And we have right in front of us is very three best, best, I'll, I'll always call them the best uh, double bass players in Singapore. So earlier we, we saw the tuba section and uh, as a band director, we know that you know, it was, was one of the toughest thing to get a tuba player, right? To recruit a tuba player into the band. And so you can imagine to recruit a tuba player is really tough. Can you imagine how to recruit a double bass player? So when a fan, someone saw, see a double bass player, they say, oh, they see a double bass instrument, they will say, oh my God, uh, uh, can I don't play the instrument? That is a monster. So today we are going to break this myth. Okay, we are really going to break this myth. We are not going to, we're going to tell everybody who's a student that double bass is cool. Double bass is really nice. And when next time, when the band director do recruitment, they would be able to tell the double bass players that there are so much things to explore beside the boring tuba parts. Ha, 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 ha. All right. So with this, I would like to introduce one by one. Let's have, uh, bring me Brendan. You want to start first? Okay. Hi, I'm Brendan. Uh, my last name is Wong. Uh, so I've been playing for what, like 20, 25 years? Yeah, I play the electric bass, double bass, and um, um, most of what I do, I'm doing now is like musicals. Um, and then I do recording as well uh, for SSO. And then other than that, yeah, I have my own shop called Bass Loft, uh, which I'm a luthier. Uh, I repair instruments, uh, double bass, electric bass, and yeah. Lah. So that's my background so far. All right, fantastic. And we'll talk a more about that looter part of it later, okay? Next, we have Sanjay, which the world knows, right, Sanjay? All right, you're going to introduce yourself. Hello, 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 everybody. Yeah, okay, I'm Sanjay. Yeah, everyone uh, seems to know me. As you can see, I have a new facial hair here. I'm enjoying the... Uh, Sanjay, is about hair. double base. It's not about facial hair. Hello. Hi, I, I, I have your hair band here. What, what it's, the first, it's the first time I have it in, like, what, 29 years, man? Oh, oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Okay, so Circuit Breaker got his pros also. Lah. Okay, so I'm Sanche. I'm a graduate from the NAFA Royal College of Music program with a degree. And I'm currently a military musician with the Singapore Armed Forces Band. Um, I'm currently uh, known as ME2 Sanche. You know, if you want to find out more about the band, you can uh, PM me after this. And we are looking forward to have more regulars. And also, I freelance whenever I can and the opportunity arises. I also love each. Uh, I've had many students and yeah, and Sung is one of them. So I think I'm doing a good job and I'm having fun and I hope to help any one of you out there who is keen to learn. All right. So when people think that uh, hey, le uh, playing a double bass always must be a guy. Uh, all right. The guy, the man, uh, masculine. I don't think so. So today oh, we would like to introduce. Not. Yeah, no, right? No, right? So today we would like to introduce you, the youngest double bass player here right now in this group chat, uh, in this room here. It's Tuning. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, this is Tuning, the youngest double bassist here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sanjay, don't laugh. Okay, anyway, I'm, I'm doing my degree pro program in NAFA now, currently the final year. And I just returned from London, from the exchange program with RCM. Uh, just like Sanche, I do, I do perform if there are opportunities and also do some teaching. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so I, I just want to, um, you know, go into something really detailed. Just now I was just telling you like tuba already very uncool to, you know, to join the tuba section. So I see that the monster like this uh, double bass, it will be a myth, you know, even, even nobody want to touch it. So a lot of times uh, when, you know, we have the second one who is really nice and tiny, all right, when they want to play a double bass, um, then you see them hold a double bass like, 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 like all this bad posture, you know, uh, doing all this thing. So today we have these three 
wonderful people here to show us what is the right posture, how to actually hold a double base properly and use the best left hand technique and the right hand technique. All right, so let's start. Go, people. Okay, so first up, we are going to start with our favorite bowl. It's called, uh, it's, it's, hold, it's held with your right hand. Yeah, and I will have uh, Brandon and Teng Ying to do some demo for us today. So, so students out there, uh, so uh, fun fact, we have two different types of bowls. One is the German bowl and one is the French bowl. So the, the French bowl is a straightforward copy from the violin, cello, viola. You know, it's similar. And then the German bowl is actually from the Baroque period, the Baroque playing of the bass. They have this type of curved bowl and uh, it slowly evolved into the German bowl that it has today that Brandon is holding. So, I shall start with the German bow because I play with the German bow myself. So, when you play with the German bow, we, we want to have a very relaxed right hand, like how you will hold a water bottle. Yeah, something round, something curved, like what Brandon is doing. The first step, you must remember, you see this skin in the middle between your thumb and your index finger here. You want to place the bow firmly in between that. Yeah, and not too tight so that you don't get injury. And then, next, your index finger and your middle finger. Keep them uh, nicely together. Do not separate so that it's stronger. And then curve it and place it on the top of the bow. Like what Brandon is doing, you can see clearly. And then next, the base of the, the bottom of the bow, you see your, your pinky needs to be curved and resting on that, near the silver part of the bottom of the bow, like what Brandon is doing depending on the length of your pinky, yeah? Nice and curved without any pressure, yeah? It should look like a semicircle, yeah? Okay, and, and lastly, people always ask, like, uh, where should you put your ring finger? Nice and relaxed anywhere. And now, Brandon, can you show them the whole shape? Yeah, so it should look nice and curved, relaxed. Whoa, Brandon, you're a good student, man, Brandon. Uh, by the way, by the way, everyone, uh, Brandon is my first teacher, uh, so oh. I am saying partly came from him. <laughs> don't don't make me sound so old, okay? <laughs> uh, okay? He was my teacher when I was in set one, uh, so you can do the math. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. oh, I think uh, Brandon, you're 18, uh, Sancho, you're 5. Yeah, yeah, pretty close. Okay, cool. Yeah, so what are the common mistakes for a, a German bow hole? Yeah, so some students... Immediately when, when, they, when they hold the German bow, right? Uh, firstly, their pinky is not curved. It's flat on the bottom. So, Brandon, can you show them a flat? Well, I cannot flatten out. Okay, <laughs> yeah. all, our, all, all our postures are pretty much firmed up, yeah? But you understand it's flat and it's, it's uh, holding yeah. you back. It's very rigid, yeah? And then you cannot move smoothly. That's one of the things that we want to avoid. And also... When we play the bass, we would like more uh, gravity, gravitational force to help us. So we always like the fingers to be at the top, pressing the bow down nicely. So students tend to put it at the side or in some funny position, the index and middle finger. Yeah, Brandon, can you do a, a worse example? Like maybe yeah. on the black color part. Oh. Ah, so they hold it in some ah, funny ways like that. And then you struggle to get the pressure on the strings. So we want to avoid this. And, and last but not least, uh, the thumb, right, is on the side of the bow instead of the top of the index finger. So now, put it at the side. Yeah, yeah, so they do this kind of funny kind of grabbing. So we want to avoid this. Yeah, so this is the three main things that I always try to avoid. Okay, so the correct hole again yeah. is everything around it. Yeah. Okay, next. Let's go try to avoid the mistakes. Next, we have the French bow. Okay, so this is the French bow. How you hold the bow is you do a half clench. So this is the shape. Yep. Then you have to rest this middle section of your finger on the stick of the wood. Yeah. Then yep. as for your thumb, right? Okay, bend slightly and rest it on this area here. Yeah, this is how you hold the French bow. And make sure you are resting your weight on this middle section. As for index finger, you can bend it slightly inwards. Yeah, so this is the French bow hold. Yep. And some common mistakes to avoid are, okay, never hold a stick 
with the inner knuckles. Don't do that. Always rest your weight on the middle segment of your joints. Yeah. Yeah. That's about I, it. I think that's really useful because, uh, you know, some bands in Singapore, we don't have many, you know, double bass, we don't have funds to engage many double bass tutors, you know. So today, you know, you demonstrated, you know, how to do a German grip and how to do a French grip on the bow. Thank you very much. And then how about posture? You know, how, how, how do they stand? Okay, so so before we go to posture, right, we also have uh, the, the left hand technique. You know, so, so pressing pressing on the strings is one very important aspect. Then after that, uh, standing well will help you. Also. Oh, you see? So I'm a, such a bad, you know, bad person. I don't even remember that's a left-hand technique now. That's how you Thank need you, to Sanjay. hire a double-based tutor, bro. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so firstly, uh, water bottle rule again. Okay, I got something round with me here. Yeah. So you see, keep your, just grab onto something round and you see your fingers are curved, right? It's nicely curved and, and the joints are all very nice. You know, it's not flattened, it's not concave, yeah? Nice and round and curved. And then you see how how it ends up. You just lift up slightly, and then this is the shape that you get. Yep, this is the side view. And when we actually press on the string, you 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 want a, a bit of hook, like what Zheng Ying showed just now for the bow. Yeah, you want this kind of shape, yeah? On the string. Yeah, so your fingers should, should be nice, round, and a bit like a claw. Yeah, this will give you a tighter grip on the strings, like what Brandon and Teng is also doing. Okay, and, and what you want to avoid is flat fingers, like that, flat or concave. I, some students can do it, they have a reverse V, you know, I don't know how they do it, like something like that. Yeah, we don't want this. Okay, this will cause injury and also you cannot press the string properly and you have bad tone. Yeah, so take care of this. And a very important aspect, some students can do the hand very well, but the thumb is very weak. Yeah. So your thumb should be also nice and curved, nice and curved. And for people with uh, longer fingers, you can put it behind the middle finger. And for people with slightly shorter fingers, perhaps between the index and middle finger. Yeah, you can see somewhere between here. Yeah, yeah. so this is for the left hand. Yeah, and one important thing, make sure your fingers don't point downwards. If it's pointing downwards, think of the opposite point upwards. Yeah, that will help. Yep. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> okay, and now to posture, like what uh, Mr. Brando is very keen to listen to. <laughs> huh? Okay, so yeah. for posture, for how, how, how we stand, you know, uh, uh, we, we try to keep our feet uh, 90 degrees, yeah? 90 degrees. So uh, a lot of us can't show our legs. Uh, maybe, Brandon, I think you are the closest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just, just take a look at how Brandon approaches the base. Yeah. Take note of his feet, yeah. Okay, you can't see my feet lah. Yeah. So generally, it's a 90 degree shape, yeah? And the, the back of the base, uh, which Brandon is going to point out, the back arc of the base, yeah, where Brandon is pointing and Tseng is pointing now. Yeah, this part rests on the hip bone. Everyone has a left hip bone, yeah? Brandon, can you point out your hip bone? Yeah. Yeah. So it's somewhere there and you rest the arc on the inside of your hip bone. Yeah, like what the both of them is doing. And and how to check if you are actually doing it right. You can let go of your base and it should fall forward. Yeah. And of course please catch it, huh? if not you destroy your base. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So that's how you check. Yeah. This then you will know if you are actually doing it right. And then the next thing you want to take note of uh, when you stand is actually your eyebrow. So this is regarding the height of the base. So your eyebrow should be around the height of the first note that you press on the base, which is called half position. So you look at Teng Ying's eyebrow and her index finger is almost aligned. And same as uh, Brandon also. Yep, so this is uh, mainly for the height and how you actually rest the base on your body. Fantastic. So we, we actually get a fantastic uh, you know, detailed explanation about how to hold the base, how to, you know, use your left hand and how to, you know, use the French bow and the German bow. Then someone, you know, like Ying Xian, straight away go on a Facebook and message, hey, what is the difference between the German and the French bow? How to choose which one to start first, you know? So maybe Sanjay, same topic, let's go on it. Okay, I don't want to sound biased because I, I, I actually have tried both, yeah? So when I was in secondary school, I started with the French bow, I really suffered until Brandon appeared Boom. And then I changed to German bow. 
yeah and that was rev- revolutionary yeah i mean it, it made me very relaxed um i enjoyed my playing a lot more because uh your arm right it's it's downwards it's it's more relaxed down here it's more relaxed yeah and uh there's less tension on the wrist as Tung you will know when you play with french bow there's a slight tension on the wrist but of course when you are professional enough you know how to get rid of it and with sufficient amount of rest and exercise, you know, it will be fine. But for beginners, definitely German bow is my choice because uh, it's easier. I feel even if I'm not sure you started with German bow, no. So in French. band, for you to play louder, German bow is the way to go. Okay, what? Oh, what? Oh, <laughs> no, just kidding, all right. <laughs> okay, so if the German bow has so much, uh, so pros to it, that. I mean, um, we're, 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 we know that in the world, there are really good German bow players, there are really good French bow players, yeah. okay? To, uh, to a point where we, we put them equal. Of course, there are pros and cons of each uh, bow uh, differences. So what are the cons of the German bow? Uh, you know, can you yeah, say something okay. on that? Yeah, definitely. So for, e- okay, I think the biggest con for a German bow, right? It tends to be slightly heavier slightly heavier than the French bow, depending on the make. And also for you to actually, um, for, for someone that is shorter, right? When you're younger, when you're around maybe 13, 14, let's say you're not so tall and have long arm, for you to actually get the right posture is a bit more difficult because you cannot bend your arms, right? Your arms have to be relatively straight. But for French bow, you can go up a bit, right? So if, if you don't have long arms, you might struggle a bit to get the right angle on your, on your strings. Your, your bow will tend to point downwards, which will create bad sound. But other than that, usually if we can adjust the bass high or find a suitable instrument in the right size, I think more or less all the cons will be uh, negligible. Lah. For young kids, of course. For Come on, Sanche. There's a big height difference between you and Jimmy. Okay? <laughs> Come on. All right, you've got to give it to Dad. When, right? when when I was in set one, I was one five something ah. I was sh- shorter than Tony and I and I saw. Hello, we got people in set one that is one four something. Okay, don't talk about one five something. Okay, then, don't talk about short. Then something is wrong if you actually put them in the base section. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, it's important, right? Yeah. So with um, I I've heard people say that you know uh German bow is a little bit more cumbersome to string cross. Yeah. You know, for string crossing, uh. Because you play uh, French and German as well, you know, you have learned both. Do you think that that is a really, really big uh, con of the of, of the German bow for string crossing? I think in band repertoire, right, like uh, maybe perhaps 70% of the music, or, okay, maybe not 70, 60% of the music, you tend to double a tuba line or, or a bassoon line, you know. So uh, you sort of get away a bit with the cumbersomeness in band. But if you are playing in a string on Zom, let's say, uh, then you will be really exposed. And then I would maybe suggest French bow. But mm. in a band where you really need sound, you need power, and you, you want to be less tired, definitely German bow. Because mm-hmm. the, the amount of notes that you play, the uh, amount of long notes that you play in band uh, can be quite scary. So German is more comfortable. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So, so you mean that uh, repertoire <clears throat> does play a difference. I mean, in yep, the you definitely. know selection of the bow. Definitely. Yeah, fantastic. That's a good. That's a good uh, insight to it. Now, beside this, now we have to move on. Beside this, you know, we we always think that uh, percussionist has the weirdest notation on the band score. You know, wow. You know, they have this weird instrument. That that weird instrument. But then, I I I think double bass have a lot of mystery as well. So today, I like you all to share about double bass you know, musical terms that is a mysterious, you know, fact to many band directors and many musicians. Can you please share, please? Thank you. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to present the notation and articulation portion. And Sanche, uh, Mr. Sanche will help us uh, demonstrate. Okay, so the the first up, if we talk about ARCO for classical, if we don't see anything on the score written on top, or if we see ARCO on the top, Okay, um, it means to play the notes with the bow. So, a uh, fine example, okay, C, E, G, G, you know, we just play with the bow. So, I'm, be- 
I want to say, I want to say, I'm going to show the hardcore. You know, so everybody can see what we are talking about. So this wonderful hardcore here. Okay. Okay, and then if we move down uh, to the next articulation, pizzicato. Uh, pizzicato means to pluck the strings with the fingers. Okay, as opposed to using the bow. This technique varies uh, between different genres. To play classical pits, okay, we generally pull the string away from the bass. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, please. Okay. Yeah, and if we want to play jazz, it's a slightly different thing. We go to a sideway uh, motion where we rest uh, after we play the string, we rest on to the next string. Okay, so from here, you can hear that the sound is a little bit different. We hear a little bit of the callus of the finger, and there's more bite to it, which is why we use this technique, uh, this uh, more jazz or pop uh, pizzicato technique, uh, so that the note can come through amongst, uh, say, drums or keyboards or whatever. All right? Very good. Yep. Okay, so let's move on to the next one, which is um, legato, all right? So legato means to, uh, notes should be played more connected with no space in between, all right? And you should aim for a similar sound to a slur, but with separate bows. Mr. Sanchez? Great. All right. Okay. These are these are all very basic uh, terms. But then for the younger players, you know, from twelve to sixteen, sometimes they don't know or they are not aware of all these little things that's written on top. Okay. So we're just highlighting that for now. So okay. After ma uh, after legato, we go to macato. What 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 what's the how how do we do macato in the, in this way? Okay. Macato is a type of accents that indicates a note to be played with more force okay so you really need to bite down onto it you should aim for an accent at the beginning of the note but the notes should not have uh, space in between all right so uh, let's let's try this okay so it's almost like a cannon now now you hear you know the bass is almost like a cannon Okay, it really punch out. So in this case, sometimes for band music, maybe this might be the sound that we want whenever the band plays like uh, uh, really loud passages and then you want the bass to push more air. All right. Okay. So let's move on to the next articulation, which is... Uh, uh, okay. So this... Um, okay, it's not potato. Uh, it's potato. All right. So... Potato, oh, all right. <laughs> Okay, now, now I feel a little bit hungry. Okay, <laughs> potato is a combination of legato and detache. Detache means detached. Okay, so the note should be played connected like a legato, but more pronounced beginning like detache. Okay, so uh, it, it will all be in one bowl. You see that slur on top? It will all be one bowl, but then they should be slightly separated. Okay, Mr. Sanchez and Ms. Uh, Zheng Ying, can you demonstrate that? Yeah, that so basically, I will play for you once separated. Yeah. And you need the now you need to get the same effect with one more. Okay, so whenever you see a slur and then you see a tenuto, this little line on top of the note, okay, you're supposed to play in one bowl, but then the notes are to be separated. Alright? Okay, let's move on to the next next one. Um Okay, and then, okay, this is detached as uh, detache as, as what uh, Mr. Sanchez has showed you just now, okay? So, just a quick demonstration. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is detache with uh, separate bowls, not in one bowl. Alright, let's uh, see the next one. Okay, so staccato. What's a staccato with, with that little dot on top? Okay, it means short or detached. But in this case, it's a little bit more, it's more detached 
than the detache. Usually when it's a dot on top, okay, this is theory. When it's a dot on top, it's half of the value. So you see a crotchet, right? A crotchet on the A. Okay, we're supposed to play a quaver whenever we see a dot on top. Okay? Okay, all right, very good. Okay, so now we come to another one. Spiccato. Spiccato sounds like staccato, but is it the same? Okay, in this case, spiccato is, is um, uh, more towards the string family. Okay, can we get a tuba to do that? I, I doubt so. All right, it's a different... Tuba, a tuba player will probably just spit in the tuba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, spit. <laughs> okay, we should get Yao Tong back later. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. Okay, so spiccato means, uh, it, it basically means to bounce off the string. It sounds like staccato, but it bounces off the string and you got to find the right... Um... Okay, where's my bow? Okay, so usually for a bass bow, um, we'll find somewhere here, you know, where it bounces um, comfortably. Okay, but also depending on the speed. If you want to bounce slower, you go nearer the frog. If you bounce a little bit faster, you go nearer the tip right is that right <laughs> okay so depending on your bow it might be a slightly different position okay so uh mr sanji can you demonstrate that okay so you hear the sound is slightly different because uh from the video you can't really see but they are actually jumping off the string this way so you get okay this way okay all right, so for the next uh, demonstration, okay, okay. Uh, how to pronounce this? Forzando. <laughs> okay, Forzando. So the S is kind of silent, okay? Forzando. So in this case, not to be a uh, mistake for a forte or fortissimo, Forzando usually means that you use more bow as well in the beginning and more attack and, and an accent, okay? So it's um the, the the meaning of it is actually suddenly with force. Okay, so you want to have that suddenly sound that okay. Uh, uh Mr. Sanchi, can you demonstrate? Yeah. So uh depending on the music and the loudness of the music that you're playing, uh before and after, this um you might use more or a little bit less bow depending on uh the balance that you get from the, the notes coming before or coming after all right and then uh next okay so this will be more interesting techniques and interesting sound okay sound ponticello what's a sound ponticello okay it means ponticello means near the bridge okay down lower at the bridge okay so uh we let uh, Mr. Sanche demonstrate that. So do you hear other than the fundamental note, you get harmonics out? Okay, so this is, uh, how is this done? It is not with a very heavy pressure. You just lay the bow right on top of the string without much pressure. Don't press down too much and just let it glide across. Okay, and you'll get the harmonics out. Okay, this can be used for effects and if you hear movies, especially horror movies or like eerie music. Oh, that's scary. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> scary movie number 10. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it, uh, the same with the French bow. It's, you know, you, you don't press too hard on it. Uh, you just get the harmonics out. Okay, so this is one sound of pon Sao Ponticello. The other way is to press really hard so you get a really, really nasal and biting sound like somebody's uh, buzzing around your ears, that, that, that kind of uh, sound. Yeah, and with the French bow. Okay, so this sounds like maybe a beginner bass player trying to play a bass, right? 
Okay, so, so you. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, this is this is the kind of sound that you want for very ugly. Um, you can call it beautiful music as well. Okay, all right. So we go now to the opposite side of it. Sao tasto. Okay, what's sao tasto? Tasto means above the fingerboard. Okay, so now we play above the fingerboard. Where this is also a common mistake for young bass players or players that don't watch out for their right hand. Okay, they try and pull it back or they don't extend their, their, their right hand. And this is the sound that you will get. And most band mus music music directors or conductors will say, hey, how come the bass no sound? I got four double basses, but the sound is not coming out. Okay, look at their bow. See where are their bow. Is it in between, uh, is it in between um, uh, the bridge and the fingerboard, the end of the fingerboard, or is it above the fingerboard? Okay, so can we demonstrate that sound, Mr. Sanche? So this is a normal sound. How often do we hear that in uh so-called younger band um uh bands and then you know the 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 double bass players all have that kind of very airy fairy kind of sound. Okay, I think, but I think three quarter of the time is is always like that and their bows tend to be like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this is something we want to avoid, always like that. Yeah, can we have Miss Turning to demonstrate that on the French bow? This is normal sound. <laughs> yeah, you get a slightly, it, it isn't muted. What you're hearing on your headphones now or on your iPad or iPhone, it, it sounds muted, but it's actually not muted. It is still kind of open, okay? But then with a very, very mild, soft sound, okay? All right. Let's move on to the next one. Um, okay, we got two more to go. Okay, called Legno. What is Legno? It's called with the stick. Okay, so in this case, um, try not to use the tip of the snake stick, okay, to play the, uh, to hit the strings. Okay, try and use the middle part because the tip, sometimes it can be a little bit fragile. If you hit too hard, this thing might break. Okay, so let's try that. Uh, the planets. Okay, and with the French bow. Yeah, so you hear a very percussive sound, and this is what the uh, uh, the sound that you want to get. All right. Okay. So now uh, let's move to the last one. All right. Okay. Now you see a little circle with a line on top. Okay, this is a pizzicato, but it's called batok pits. Okay, what's a batok pits? Okay. Okay, so with this, you want the string to hit against the fingerboard so that you get a percussive sound as well, but you still have the fundamental. Alright, so if there's any more uh, notation or articulations that you are unsure of, please post it on Facebook and then uh, maybe you can answer them later. Yeah, so that's all for now for notation and articulation. Oh my god, that is a lot. That was really, really a lot. You know, those people who are trying the last one, Bartok piece, uh, please don't try to break this, the string. You know, if you try to break the string, <laughs> you'll be really, really, you can't practice at home with the COVID-19. Uh. All right, so with that, I would like to bring you to the next topic. All right, so we have a myth that, you know, hey, double bass players in the band, right? Band score is so boring. You know, most of the time, either you play the bassoon part or you play the baritone sax part or you play the tuba part. Am I right? Right, Brandon? Am I right? Yes. Yeah. So we we, we must we must address this today because uh, there are many, many uh, bass players as well as band directors, which they can then recommend you know, to, to the teachers, uh, to the students, not to the teachers, to the students, what resources they can embark on. You know, where, what resources they can start to find online and what to do. So with that, I'll, I'll leave turning. Turning, can you share with us, you know, these important uh, exercises, etudes, as well as band scores that they can pick it up? Yeah, okay. I have two exercises here. The first one is to help. Um, it's more of the left hand. 
so for this exercise is to help train the agility of your fingers and also other good things include um, to secure and to fix your handshake and also to build strength for your forefinger. Yeah, for your forefinger. Okay, when you start with this exercise, space out your fingers nicely such that all the fingers are nicely in place. So first finger on E flat, second on E, then the fourth on F. Yeah, then you lock this shape. Then let's try this tap and release action. Okay, release, tap, release, tap. Your finger has to be really percussive. And can, you can hear the sound of your finger tapping against your fingerboard. While doing this, make sure you lock all your fingers down, hold it down. Don't leave any other fingers. Sanchi, can you please do a demonstration, please? I'm the best angle. Yeah. Okay, here you go. Sanchi. Okay, remember, every time when you're practicing an exercise, do it with a metronome. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Must always have a bad demo first, then you can remind the students. <laughs> what a great way! Okay, this and some common Sanchi. problems from the first exercise is some students tend to leave the first finger. Remember, everything lock it down. And sometimes they tend to slide the fingers close to towards the second finger. Make sure you lock the shape and, and this shape has to be constant throughout all four strings. Yeah, okay, then the next exercise. Okay, this exercise is to train even bow usage. So you try on the lower half of your bow. So you start here, the frog, and you end here, the middle part of the bow, use this much. Uh, make sure every time when you do a bow change, the, the starting and ending point has to be the same. And when you play, make sure you're using flat hair, 100% hair, on the string. 100% hair on the string. Don't tilt three quarter or anything less, 100%. Okay. Brandon, can you please demonstrate for us, please? Okay, hold on. Uh, hold on, ah. Uh. Uh -huh. Sure. Oh, how do I do this? Mm. Oh, okay. Okay, so... So, 100% hair on the string. On purpose as well, learning from Sanche. Very good. Okay, to this exercise, you can try out different variations like um, you start with the lower half, do it on the middle, and do it on the upper half. Also, you can try it on different parts of the bow. So, I mean, different parts of the bay, sorry. Fingerboard and close the bridge. Yeah, it helps to build intensity. Thank you. So uh, just to add on to what uh, Zheng Yi had to say, so for slightly more advanced player, perhaps uh, maybe set 3 or set 4, you already understand how the bass works, you sort of can play the music. Some things that you want to keep in check will be making sure that you are doing the right things consistently. So how you move across the strings horizontally is very important. You want to make sure that you are always on the same line. Yeah, So you have to visually... Uh, look at your fingers and this exercise will help you with that so if you can see my fingers let me just come closer yeah. okay so look at the hands you want to make sure that when you cross string it's in the same tempo and i got my metronome this time 
Yeah, so if you can see, my hands did not move downwards or my fingers did not collapse and uh, my, my first index finger did not point downwards and, and, and it did not collapse into a weird shape, yeah? So keep it nice and firm and with a, a and well spaced out. This is most important. 90% of the students in secondary school can't do this properly. So it's a good exercise. And so this was for horizontal. Next, I'll show you something that is for vertical. Mr. Brando, please. It's okay. Mr. Brandon. Okay. No, no. Uh, the, yeah, okay. Uh, the next one. Yes. Yes. So this is uh, to how, how you move downwards. The main thing that you want to take care of is how you move your thumb, right? Your thumb should not be pointing upwards, yeah? It should be. It should be behind your middle finger and always perpendicular, yeah? Not pointing upwards, yeah? So, vertical exercise. Three. And for beginner students, when you practice, do this with four counts, two counts, one count to build some uh, muscle memory. This is most important. This is uh, one of the key things that we need to build as a basic. Yeah. Fantastic. So on the same note. Right, uh, one student straight away wrote in and said, you know, often times the band repertoire does not include the bass parts, you know, and then bass students often end up reading the tuba part and then the, there's a pitfall to look at what happens, right? How do the brass articulation, such as accent and a combina combination of staccato, slurs, tenutos translate to the bass? Is there something that, you know, we could uh, address on this? Um, maybe maybe I can just say something quickly. It's a, it's yes. a good question. It, it's good that you're actually taking note that uh, articulation in band uh, music is really key. And the wind players actually do it uh, mostly with their tongue and the air speed, air flow. Yeah, so for basses, like, like what Brandon uh, showed just now with the articulation marks, right? So if you want to play short notes, definitely do not use the whole note. Yeah, you need to have a good pressure on the spot. And, and you still can play loud while using little bow. Yeah, you still can play loud. If you want to get louder, you can go closer to the bridge, but not all the way down, yeah? And for you to like actually do slurs, right? Really go and work on your string crossing, how you get from string to string. In, 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 in wind band, a lot of students tend to have funny sounds when they cross string, like... You tend to touch other strings. So you need to set your angles right. So if this is angle A, when you play the next string, you fix one angle. So you change sharp, sharp, sharp. Yeah? Try not, try not to have too many variations. Yeah, maybe Brandon and Tony can add something about that. Okay, so uh, in response to Arian, um, yeah, we often read the tuba parts and then whatever combinations of accents or staccato and slurs that you see on it, okay, those are basically uh, written by the co co composer or arranger and then those translate across all instruments, all right? You can't have a flute player playing, I, I mean, you can depending on the arrangement, but depending for, for double bass using the tuba part, Usually, you can just read as it is and follow accordingly because they are double instrument. Okay, the reason why we are called doubling, uh, double, double bass is because in the past, one of the reasons is because we double the cellos. So whatever the cellos play, we try and follow that. Unless there's a different sound that we're looking for, but then that will be a little bit more, uh, I guess, um, a little up to the arranger to arrange that music. Okay, but usually uh, we follow exactly. So other than following the tuba scores, what the conductor can actually look out for is look out for bassoon parts, look out for bass clarinet parts because those articulations are closer to the double bass sound than what a tuba uh, would be because the, the, the bassoon being a double read, the bass clarinet being a single read, 
has that kind of airy, airy, you know, buzzy sound that we do get from the double bass. So look out for those parts and follow those parts also, you know. And if there's any contrasting parts, then yeah, as a conductor, uh, you are you have the freedom to choose how you want your double bass to sound. Fantastic. I think, Brendan, that was a really good uh, illustration on that because, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, we always get the tuba players to demo. And now you are saying that, you know, we get the bassoon to demo and get a bass clarinet to demo. I think that that sound needs to be, you know, so as a student, maybe they should get to their friend and say, hey, bass clarinet player, can you just play this part for me? And then how it sounds like a bass clarinet and we are trying to duplicate it on the bass. Am I right, Brendan, to say that? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, including the length of the notes because everybody has different concept of how long should that crotchet be or that tenuto or that staccato is. And uh, if you look at string quartets or you look at, uh, you know, uh, chamber and zom, that's how they work together to get a very cohesive sound because their length of notes or their length of rest is the same. Fantastic. Okay. Now, back to Chen Ning. you there, there, there must be um, some other band excerpts as well as an orchestra or excerpt that you want to share. And um, because we are already running out of time, so we might have to share a little bit faster. So maybe we want to share what is a band score that they can, you know, pull out. Sanche, maybe you want to, you want to also demonstrate later. Okay, let's, let's turn it over to you. Yeah, okay, for excerpts, right, band excerpts, you can check out Noah's art. Sanche, would you like to play for us? Yeah, sure. So Noah's Ark is one of my favorite band music because it has a really prominent bass part uh, towards the end. Yeah, Song of Hope in Noah's Ark. Those bassists out there that know this, uh, this is a slight uh, enjoyment time for you. Yeah? So always be prepared in band. You are not always going to play long notes. So these kind of parts might suddenly appear and you might want to quit band. So make sure you are ready with good basics. And yeah, here is how it sounds like. And this time it's without metronome because it's a performance. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. Sanche, I think that was really good. All right. Now, if you are a beginner and you just took out Noah's up, all right, uh, you really can't straight away, you know, do what Sanche is doing. Please, you know, uh, you have to then take it slower and all that. I believe, Sanche, you want to give some advice on that? Uh, to all students out there, right, the first thing that you want to work on always is skills. Skills, skills, and skills. And and that there's, there's this uh, really good website if you don't know your basic theory, you don't know, you don't have any background in music, you can go to this website called www.tonesavvy. T O N E S A V V Y dot com. This website actually provides you a lot of fundamental training in scales, oral, uh, chords, and as a basis, you need to keep your ears fresh to listen out to your intonation, listen out to the band. So go and work on that while you have time in your holidays now, yeah? And always scales. Yeah, Turn it knows. I tortured them with scales. <laughs> it's, it's not tortured, it's called enlightened. Oh, oh yes, I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Tony, got another, uh, some orchestra excerpt that you, they can practice on as well. You want to show that as well? Yeah, okay. Some notable um, orchestra excerpts are the elephant and also Mahler one. Sanchi, would you like to demonstrate? Yeah, so actually this uh, piece of music was actually one of the first uh, sort of solo piece that I was introduced to in secondary school by Mr. Brandon here, yeah? It's called The Elephant uh, from uh, Carnival of the Animals. So if you actually uh, do well in your band career, you move on to becoming an orchestra player, this is something that you might actually get to play in future. I'll just play you a short excerpt.
Sure and sounds like an elephant. Yes, exactly why it was written for the bass. <laughs> and also, and in case you were thinking that, you know, the bass only plays low notes, we only uh, get to double other instruments. There's this really famous solo in a Mahler symphony uh, in the third movement. You know, it features the double bass solo. Many of you uh, might find this tune familiar because it sounds like uh, Are You Sleeping Brother John in the major key, but this solo is in the minor key. So here you go, uh, this is the Mahler solo. <laughs> Fantastic, Sanjay. That was really a moment that uh, I nearly fall asleep while listening to that. Fantastic. <laughs> that, that was it was really good because uh, you know, a lot of times uh, you know, the limited resources you have on the band score, that always you know, students will come and ask us, hey, what can we practice? What can we practice? Thank you for sharing that. You know, sending that was really good, and uh, thank you for demonstrating, Sanjay. That yep. was really really useful. All right. On on that note. Um, maybe we can also introduce some, you know, um, resources uh, where you can actually find some of the stuff, you know, and that, that's important. So can we briefly talk about that, Zaneng? Can you hear me, Zaneng? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sanchi, would you like to talk about this? I think yeah. you prepared yeah. the materials for this section. Okay, so, fantastic. Yeah, so basically, um, there are music shops in Singapore where you can find etude books, scales books, uh, they, they include uh, shops like Singwin. Um, and also, if you if you have to order stuff, I'm sure Mr. Brando here, who has a company, is willing to bring in scores for you. And do also let your conductors know. There, there are, if you can go online and actually look at the ABRSM website, yeah, you, you have all the, the books where they get the scales and the pieces. And I think those are really great for beginners. Of course, you can choose volume 1, volume 2. Try not to go too high standard. Unless, of course, you want to challenge yourself. And also, if you happen to play in a string ensemble, uh, maybe there are other bases here, or you know, you want to play in an orchestra in the future, there's this uh, website called uh, orchestraexcerpts.com. Uh, and, and of course, the famous uh, website IMSLP, that's where you can get a lot of your scores from. So don't Fantastic. be shy to download them. Yep. Fantastic. Later, later we will provide some links uh, on this Facebook comment part of it. All right. Uh, definitely, we are not promoting that uh, you're going to buy from us or anything like that. But do actually uh, check out the resources and all that uh, on our Facebook comment later. And of course, uh, ABRSM is quite a good resource that you can actually uh, work on it. As you can see, that online with pros, uh, they, are, they are sponsoring us. ABRSM, you can see that. All right. Right on top of me. All right. Okay. All right, next, uh, we would like to talk about something else, and that's uh, something that is uh, really inspiring because you know that uh, a lot of times when we are learning an uh, instrument, all right, when we're learning an instrument, a lot of times uh, people will think that uh, how do we actually uh, learn from, who do we listen to, you know, should we have an idol in our head? So maybe three of you can comment on that. Yeah, Brandon, would you like to start? Okay, I think... Uh... I think for today's students or even adults, when you start learning an instrument, there are tons of resources on the on the web, YouTube. And there are good ones and there are also bad ones. So uh, I think well, we will list out some of the good ones which we feel is, 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 is good to follow. And uh, in this case, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the difference between my time when I was learning. I'll go buy a CD. I'll listen to that CD again and again and again and again, okay? So in that, in that way, I absorb whatever sound that I want or I love, depending on which CD I buy or which player, and I go towards that sound. The problem with YouTube these days is you have so many, and then you end up with like, okay, which sound do I go for? Who do I love? And then what sound gets ingrained into my mind? So I think that's a, that's a little bit of difference like, between the, how I, I was learning and how this new generation is learning. And of course, with every generation, it just gets better and better and better. Just look at Sanjay and Zuning. All right? Okay. So, uh, yeah. 
any y'all y'all got anything? So so what were some of the famous players and uh YouTube channels that you actually listen to, Zheng Yi? Um, actually, I've got a list, but I'll just mention uh two. The first one is Mikyong Song, so she's a Korean female bassist. Okay, she plays on the German bowl. Uh, she's very well known for her virtuosity and also musicality, and she has won many competitions like uh the Swagger competition and ISB competition. And one achievement is in early twenty eighteen, she auditioned for Shanghai Symphony Orchestra, and also then she won a principal position there. Also, she taught in the Shanghai Orchestra Academy alongside members of the New York Phil. However, in twenty nineteen, she resigned from the orchestra and, and the academy to focus on her new family and also to build her career as a soloist. Yeah. Then the second uh, bass female soloist that I'm going to feature is Laurence Pierce. So she plays on the French bowl. Uh, she's a double bass soloist and educator currently based in Texas, US. Uh, okay, she teaches at Discover Double Bass, which is this online learning platform that has several bass teachers, and what I like about Lawrence is she posts uh videos of virtuosic arrangement very regular, very very regularly, and also she has lessons for basses and she often hosts like discussions on bass related topics. Yeah. Fantastic. So Brendan, you saw that you move they move out from your CD collections to you know online media that you know we can then research on. Fantastic. And on with that, uh, turning later we'll provide those uh, two resources that you you have you have shared with us, and we're going to put it on the Facebook comment. So if you are watching, if you are double bass, you know aspiring to be a double bass uh, good player like all three of them, please do watch those two links later. All right, and can, can, you can come back later to get the links. All right. And with that, you know a lot of people have this. Uh, we have been talking about. Band music. We have been talking about classical music. We have been talking about、uh, all these wonderful, great genre. But there's one genre that I think that the double bass is very, very versatile. I think the double bass is one of the most versatile instrument. You know, and there's one genre that maybe we could discuss on. Brendan, over to you. Maybe you want to talk about some jazz stuff, right? Because a lot of double basses must be thinking that, hey,、uh, you know, playing band music is. Is good, you know. Learning some etudes is fantastic. Doing some exercises is good. But then there is this genre that they can explore on as well. Brandon, over to you. Okay, so as、uh, the double bass, you know, is very synonymous synonymous with、uh, classical music. It is also with jazz, you know, in bars and stuff like that. Okay, so what、uh, I will talk about it for for band music is、um, very often you do get pop. And jazz pieces inside as well, and how to play them, or the technique, or the sound, as we demonstrate just now, like the different pizzicato technique. So、uh, I will touch on it uh, 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 very quickly because we're running out of time, also. Okay.、Yes. So for 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 classical, we see that、um, we will pluck outwards to get this kind of sound, but for jazz, we want to to get this to get that little bit more attack. And how do we do this? We can use For a beginner, we can, or, or even a amateur,、uh, not amateur, professional bass player, you know, you can use two fingers, put the middle finger on top of the other one, or the other way around, depending on what you're comfortable with, to get more strength and in very in a very curved shape. Okay, pluck downwards at right at the end of the fingerboard. All right, around this area, and you get a different sound than this, right? And where you pluck will ha- will have a different sound. So like. What we hear with Sao Ponticello or Sao Tasto. Okay, I'm just gonna play a very sim-、uh, simple blues for you, which I think you all might be able to download later. And、um, what I'm gonna share with you also is、uh, this thing called、um, I Will Be, which everybody is using now, and、um, it provides tracks for you to play、um, uh, alongside with it. Okay, so I'm gonna pull this up. And see whether y'all can actually hear the sound. Okay, so we're gonna share screen. Okay, can we all? Okay, let me pull out the sound. Okay. Oh, my metronome is still running. Good example, ah,、huh? you. Keep it going. Okay, so.
Fantastic. Come on, everybody. Okay, one thing I need to say is uh, as a classical bass player, Ben, Ben, in, in, oh. um, sorry. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to say, like, for band directors and conductors, um, when you are in school and then the bass player is playing their double bass, the setup for double bass for classical and jazz can be very and vastly different. Although a uh, 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 mix in between can be done so that it, it, it can be played nicely. Okay, like this bass over here is set up for classical. So it's generally higher. For me to put my finger across and to play over them, it is actually a little bit tougher. And some of the more so-called virtuosic thing that I want to do with pizzicato, I can't really do over here. All right. But so bear that in mind when you're in school, and the DAO bases, if they are not set up properly, don't really expect your younger kids to be able to pull that off because it is very difficult for them. And in cases, it might you will get blister and you will bleed and stuff like that. So I would say uh, check on the DAO bases and get them to a very good, uh, get, get them to be set up properly. And then your students can play your instrument effortlessly. Fantastic, fantastic. So on that, on that note, Brandon, you know, I we, we heard in the beginning that you are a looter, you know, you do a little bit of uh, bass fixing and all that. So can you elaborate a little bit on that? You know, what are the common things that needs to be addressed for okay. simple maintenance? I think uh, for simple maintenance, say at home, I don't think um, you can't really maintain too much other than wiping down your rosin, which is very important because I've seen uh, loads of rosin on some bases and then they are never clean off. You know, it is very unsightly. So for 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 everybody, you know, once you finish playing with your bowl, you know, take a dry cloth. Uh, don't use uh, yeah, use a cloth, a lint-free cloth if you can. Don't use uh, some tissue paper because the tissue paper will stick onto the 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 the, the strings or the fingerboard and, and and all that. Okay, so clean that off. Uh, if I'm gonna go into a very very basic maintenance or to check your dial base or if you are buying your first dial base and all that. Okay, perhaps these are the things that uh, you can actually just very quickly see. Okay, like what I screen share over here. Okay, when you look at our base, check that the south post is in there. Okay, it is standing upright. It is not um, uh, down on the floor or whatever. Okay, check your strings. Make sure that they are in the middle. Okay, your bridge is sitting in the middle. Okay, right. Okay, it's sitting in the middle. And then um, check the notches that they are not foul too deep if they are if they are foul too deep it it might create a mute on your instrument and it will not sound as good as it is okay and this is very important this one this 90 degree thing that we see over here make sure the base the bridge is not falling forward okay if we can see some of the bases in school we can see that this is more like 110 or 100 degrees you know and then we are waiting for accident to happen in that case. Either the bridge will break or either it will fall. And that is very dangerous for the student. Okay, okay, this is a little bit more of a close-up. And then check the string slots that they are not too deep as well. They are just maybe about 0.51 mm above uh, the, the, the very end of the fingerboard near the nut. Okay, check your strings that they are not frilling. Okay, on the E and the A, they should lie on this side, on, on, on the left side of the picture. On the G and the D, it should lie on the right side. They should not crisscross. If they crisscross and they slide against each other, abrace, uh, it might be ab abrasive and then it will break off at the end of the day. Yeah. All right? So, saddle, this is uh, very common. You know, like this uh, tailpiece gut is being pulled up um, and there's friction on the saddle. Make sure that there's no gap here. If there's a gap, you know, bring it into my shop. Uh, we'll fix that for, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's not, it's a common thing, but it's not difficult. So, and then when you're restringing, make sure that the, the, the uh, that little brass or little metal piece that's underneath is not sitting in the hole, okay? Because 
it might come out anytime. Okay, make sure that it's right inside. Okay, yeah. And okay, one thing about uh, people asking, okay, how should I maintain my base at home? Is humidity a problem in Singapore? I would say yes, humidity is a Singapore uh, problem in Singapore. But then um, don't go out and buy a dehumidifier. I, ha I have bought a dehumidifier, dehumidifier and then it has created a lot of uh, heat in the room and then you have to pour out your water every now and every day actually. So what I suggest uh, is turn on your aircon for like 15, 20 minutes for uh, three to four hours each day, you know, just cool the room down. Uh, that will get the humidity down to about 60, okay? Don't have to go beyond that as in go down to 40 or 50 thinking that you are in Europe or whatever because it will do more damage to your instruments that way, all right? And if you want to know about uh, having a humidified uh, um, climate control thing in your room or whatever, you can always ask me because my workshop is set up that way and then it automatically turns on the aircon or turn it off whenever the humidity is too high or too low. Yeah, you can always PM me. Yep. Fantastic, Brandon. Thank you for sharing and that's really wonderful. I think that, uh, you know, this little uh, showcase of, you know, how to maintain your base and all that is very important for all the base students. Um, later, uh, we have a lot of questions, but uh, we don't have much time. So I'm suggesting later, maybe you know, any one of you can go to the Facebook command to see those questions and maybe you can then input the questions. Well, for now, I think that a lot of people are very uh, interested to know about your professional, you know, journey as a base player. I think that is very interesting, you know, Sanjay was sharing that, hey, Brandon was my teacher. And then, Sun Ying, and then Sanjay was also sharing that, hey, Sun Ying is my student. You know, I think that this is something that, uh, you know, as a, as a young double bass player, we want to know how, you know, we can develop to where Brandon is, where Sanjay is, and where Sun Ying is. So maybe you want, we want to start going. Let's go. Sun Ying. <laughs> yeah, Sun Ying. Okay. Yeah, so I started with the violin piano then in secondary school I joined a band that's where I started where, where I started the bass yeah uh, at first I didn't take it seriously until like a certain point in secondary school that's where I decided to do it uh, to do music as career and when I entered NAFA um, I had a huge culture shock because I was I wasn't expecting like uh, so much of solo playing and also different opportunities like to play in orchestra, to play in Chinese on Zom, and maybe win on Zom, win band. Yeah, so I, what I'll say is, if you want to do music seriously, maybe you can go and explore like different opportunities out there for bass. And also, um, listen to lots of repertoire, like solo playing, uh, band works, and also orchestra works. So at least when you're in NAFA, you won't have a very hard time there. Yeah, it's good preparation. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's really insightful, you know, as a student, how you need to prepare yourself when you are really planning to study, you know, double bass as a full-time student. All right, good. Over to, over to you, Sanjay. How about you? Okay, so, um, I mean, I've came a long way since my big, my roots. La. I used to play the violin and uh, you can see that I totally let go of it. La. Those of you that watched my recent video, I actually try again. Uh. Yeah. Hopefully Sound good. Uh. COVID-19 COVID has helped you on that. Uh. Of course, I actually refresh a bit. Anyway, so, so Mr. Brando was actually mentioning that the bass is the most versatile instrument and I cannot agree more with that statement. You know, uh, throughout my career as a bassist, I've played in the Chinese orchestra, in the Indian orchestra, Malay orchestra, and also in wind band, in orchestra, in string ensembles. I mean, it, it cannot get any more versatile than that. If you can find an instrument that can do all these, uh, heads off to you lah. But I doubt there is, honestly. Maybe percussion, <laughs> but other than that, no. Yeah, so um, as a young bassist in band, do not be afraid to go out to the community bands, community orchestra. Just go uh, and get as much experience as you can. You know, play, play in as many bands as you can. Make, spend your weekends uh, playing music, making new friends, because that is where you get your experience and uh, that is also where you will get your opportunity. So when I was young, I actually joined uh, this uh, band called National Youth Wins, formed by Mr. Brando here. Uh, no, 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 formed by Band Directors Association, uh, okay? The Brand Director Association, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so it, it actually gave me my first opportunity as a double bass tutor, you know, by performing well in the band, 
making new friends, making new contacts, meeting all the conductors that were there. I think that was the highlight of my young career as a musician. And uh, Mr. Brando actually has a very nice photo of that. I don't know if he still keeps it, you know. <laughs> later, I'll show it. Later, I'll show it, okay? We, we, we have lots of memories, huh? Yeah, yes. so, so uh, I actually stayed in the East when I was young, you know. So I actually traveled to Jurong, Woodlands, you know, to play in a uh, wind band uh, over there, like New South Wind Orchestra, you know, then I played with Fuyu. So as many places as you can. And uh, one important advice, try not to let money be the main reason you make music. Because uh, one day when you're pro enough, people will automatically pay you. That's for sure. So when you're young and you have not uh, gotten to that stage, do as many gigs as you can, as many performances as you can, because that's the only way you will grow. Fantastic, Sanjay. That was really good sharing. And uh, Brandon, over to you. Right now, you are on a different stage now. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, like what everybody has said, uh, have have said you know go out and try things and uh, play this play that so for me you know I I went from electric bass to double bass and the techniques that I I've learned from either instrument have brought me across you know I use electric bass technique on double bass I use double bass technique on electric bass you know so uh, spread uh, do do everything you know of course um, then try and always excite yourself, motivate yourself, learn new things. You know, I, for one, um, I, I, I get bored with things very fast. And then I'll, I'll, I'll try and do this or do that. I'll do classical. I went back to school four years ago, you know, which I, I, I think it's, it's, it's probably unheard of over here, you know, went back, going back to school at 36 to do my degree, you know, for, for music. It's really tough. But uh, if you have the opportunity, go back and do it. You know, so for me, uh, other than classical, I do yeah musicals, I do pop shows, I do rock shows sometimes, you know, you know. So uh, explore everything and play everything and uh, like with all the resources that you have online, go and uh, spend some time on it. You know, there are a lot of free resources these days. And then as for me, like what Brando say, okay, I'm in a different stage. Kind of, I still love playing music, but also I love to see people enjoying their instrument which is why I started uh, my luthiery uh, adventure, which I'm still learning. And there's a lot of people that, that, that's, uh, that is also teaching me and a lot of resources online as well. And people trusting me with their bases. Yeah, so uh, yeah, for Bass Loft, this is really created for you players out there to make you play better, to make you uh, more comfortable with the instrument that, that you have. And of course, for Singapore, we know that it is a very small country. You want to find a good base? Where can we go? Uh, sometimes it's not about the uh, price of the base, but how the base is being set up. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, feel free to dial me up and then uh, I, we can get that sorted out. Fantastic. So, so, so on that note, right, if you want if you want to actually find out more about, you know, the physical double base itself, you know, how to set it up properly, like what Brandon has really emphasized, you know, please go and PM him later. You know, we are all on Facebook Live. Uh, you can, you know, search for him, Brandon Wong, and then you can start to find him. Now, I can hear all three of you. Fantastic. You are saying lifelong learning is such an important journey, right, for all musicians. I believe it's not only for musicians, for everybody in Singapore as well. So I, I hope with this, you know, I thank you from the Band Directors Association, online with the pros, double bases. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Turning. Really appreciate your time with us today. And uh, we are looking forward to the next session at 1.30, 1.30 with the trombones, all right? So if you have any questions, I know there's a lot of questions on Facebook Live right now, all right? So later, some of you will, you know, go and uh, help me, Sanjay. Brandon or Tony, you can go to actually comment on their post and then we can then, uh, you know, address some of these issues offline instead of Facebook Live. Is it okay, everybody? Yep. So on behalf of Band Directors Association, we would like to thank everybody. Tune in, watch us online with the pros, double bass. So now double bass, we all know it is not a boring instrument. It is very interesting instrument. It's a versatile instrument. In fact, more interesting than the 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 two 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 two